A wonderful good afternoon from my side after the interlude of modern technology. Um, I have been invited to talk about uh, the state of post-Keynesian macroeconomics. And as any good academic, I will, of course, mostly talk about my own work. And along the way, we'll comment a little bit on the state of mainstream economics and um, on uh, uh, the state of, of post-Keynesian economics and where I see uh, some advances or interesting openings. I hope that my title, Weak Ties, Empirical Deficits, and an update on Kalecki-Minsky agenda will become clearer in uh, the course of the presentation. I should say, as um, Miriam briefly mentioned, uh, I'm also giving this almost as a goodbye presentation uh, in my identity as an economist since uh, the 1st of September. I'm technically not an economist anymore, but an international political economist, as it turns out. <laughs> um, it, in in the, just a few minutes uh, before the presentation, when I told this to a friend here uh, that I'm now an international political economist, I said, oh, you got a promotion. So what will I be talking about? Uh, I'll say a few words about the political background um, that we are finding ourselves in. I'll then uh, comment on the state of mainstream economics, in particular think a little bit about uh, what new Keynesian economics is, um, and then comment on the state of post-Keynesian economics, and then uh, I'll begin to uh, give you a bit of a progress report on uh, what I call Kalecki-Minsky research uh, agenda, in which I'll introduce you to the notion of good, pseudo-Goodwin cycles. I'll talk a little bit about the relative size of financial and distributional effects. I'll talk about endogenous financial cycles, briefly comment on inequality and end uh, with some empirical estimates on unemployment hysteresis. Uh, and I'll try uh, to have to end on a positive note. Uh, the political background, I'm really stating uh, the obvious here. Uh, the political background is one where we have witnessed the worst financial and economic crisis in two generations which, however, did not turn into uh, a Great Depression, except for some Southern European countries. That's a, a non-trivial uh, qualifier, and the fact that it hasn't turned into the Great Depression has a lot to do with the fact that by historical standards, actually there was quite strong counter-reactions by governments, both in terms of the size of fiscal deficits uh, that were occurred uh, in 2008, 2009, uh, and in terms of the quantitative easing that followed. So instead of a Great Depression, what we got was a lost decade. And that lost decade in Europe came with a divergence of economic experience, uh, thus counteracting the period of uh, at least apparent convergence within Europe uh, in the decade before that. And it has led to a situation where uh, neoliberalism has lost its hegemony, but it has not lost power. So in other words, we are seeing uh, to the left as well as to the right uh, growing discontent with neoliberalism, uh, but policymaking ultimately is firmly uh, still uh, in that direction. It has, uh, that political discontent uh, has in recent years, essentially moved uh, to the right. Uh, where I'm coming from, Britain uh, is one of the countries where there's a bit of a revival uh, of a traditional social democratic party. But by and large, politically, uh, the crisis and its aftermath has been uh, a disaster for much of the left, both in the sense of the radical left, uh, that in the form of Syriza uh, took over government in Greece, but also in terms of uh, the German and Austrian social democracies uh, that are now a pale shadow of what they, what they used to be, and that despite the fact that those countries uh, actually hadn't had uh, such a bad uh, crisis. 
thinking about that situation, uh, I can't help thinking about uh, Matsuba's book, Dark Continent, uh, which is a, a history of Europe in the 20th century, and essentially uh, the, the angle that he's taking there is that he says he does not want to read Europe's <laughs> history uh, through the lens of the post war uh, normalcy, where essentially you have a, a, a solid liberal democratic uh, uh, consensus, but rather thinks of the period in between the wars where you have a strong fascist movement, but also uh, a strong left as a normal situation. That may well be the situation that we will find ourselves in in the course of the next years or even decades. And one question on which I have no answer is what the implications of that for post-Keynesian economics is. It would seem to me that if I think about uh, the research that we are doing, essentially post-Keynesian uh, theory is quite well equipped uh, to engage in an ideological battle with neoliberalism. It's a lot less clear whether post-Keynesian economics is well equipped to an ideological battle with the fascists. So in that sense, I think there, there is something uh, for us to contemplate here. A few words on mainstream economics. And mainstream economics in the field of macroeconomics uh, is essentially the new Keynesian DSG model. And that has proven uh, surprisingly robust against the challenges of the real world uh, and the ex experiences that policymakers but also uh, the, the population has had. However, it's a bit unfortunate, I think, that New Keynesian economics nowadays is so strongly associated with the uh, uh, New Keynesian DSG model. If you rewind back to the 1980s and 90s, early 1990s, that is, essentially New Keynesian economics was a quite rich array of partial models uh, that incorporated, that, that has at its core features that they accepted micro foundations but did reject the notion or the, uh, the assumption of market clearing. Uh, and thus they range from Stiglitz's uh, asymmetric information models to staggered wage and price setting models. Uh, the Nairo, there was multiple equilibrium models. There was noise trader models. What I want to get at is that there was a time when new Keynesian economics, uh, while most of us in this room would be critical of it, actually had interesting challenges uh, for us to put. Uh, and I think it's quite fortunate that new Keynesian economics is nowadays uh, narrowed down to, to the DSG track, which in my view is one of the least attractive or uh, uh, inspiring aspects of it. So when I think about the current state of, of new Keynesian economics, I guess there's two contradictions uh, that stand out. One is sort of the lack of much interesting to read on the theoretical front. Essentially, there's a lot of research that puts another restriction in a rather ad hoc way into a DSG model and then tries to demonstrate something. Uh, the standard example is to put uh, interest rate spreads into a DSG model because of different risk perception in a model that essentially doesn't know bankruptcy. Uh, so we have a lot of these exercises uh, and I have to admit, I have limited patience for that. On the other hand, if you look at the empirical front, I can give you quickly a list of a dozen papers that I think are excellent papers, uh, with some due qualifications, of course, but those papers tend to be heavily empirically driven. They are often, re from our perspective, reinvented in post-Keynesian wheels, but then again, the wheel is probably worth being invented several times, so don't want to hold it too much against the new Keynesian. So let me give you a few examples. I think that the recent papers of Plochard on hysteresis, the empirical ones, are very strong. Obviously, I think a lot uh, in the room here quite fond of the Piketty-Sayes uh, 
uh, Atkinson research on inequality. I think that Mian and Sufi have done excellent work on uh, discussing macroeconomic questions with microeconomic data. The work in the BIS and in the Bank of England on financial cycles, I think, is very interesting and we can extend that list. And indeed, over the last year at this conference, we repeatedly uh, had, uh, had speakers uh, uh, from that list uh, on the panels here. The second comment is, uh, in the US, one gets the impression that uh, the old sweet water, salt water divide uh, has broken up again, with quite harsh criticisms uh, of some uh, sweet water, uh, salt water economists against uh, the hard uh, neoclassical core of DSG modeling. Think of the, the, the polemic paper by Paul Romer, but we had earlier similar papers uh, by, by Paul Krugman. If you think of some uh, of Europe, somehow it's more of an, I'm tempted to say, intellectual graveyard. There's not much of that to feel which may have to do something with the dominance uh, of, of Germany in Europe, but even if you think of people like Simon Rand Lewis, whose uh, blog on economic policy issues I find excellent, in economic theory terms, he's essentially defending the DSG models and then says, well, but we should also do some econometrics on the side to, to also have some realism in what we are saying. Um, De Graube, who again has made some, some very interesting uh, policy interventions, in particular around the role uh, of uh, the, the ECB, also as a, uh, justifying its intervention uh, in uh, the government bond markets. Again, he's quite <laughs> cautious in he goes after uh, the mainstream, and if you read his recent book, The Pendulum Swimming Back, uh, it, it's quite disappointing from a, from a theoretical uh, point of view. Where is post-Keynesian economics these days? Thinking about post-Keynesian economics, one of the things that stand out for me is that post-Keynesian economics is a relative well-defined theory with a quite large, agreed, common body uh, of analytical uh, uh, core, and I'm not gonna go through uh, uh, the details of that now, assuming that, uh, that these are known. I'm saying that because if you think of other uh, heterodox streams, if you think in particular of ecological economics, of feminist economics, or Marxism, these are theories that don't have such a strong common theoretical core. They have essentially a set of agreed questions in the case of, of ecological economics and feminist economics and essentially a, a political agenda in, in, the, in, the terms, uh, in terms of Marxism. But it's not, it doesn't have that sense of agreement. Um, and I have for quite a while thought of that as a strength and have recently started to doubt whether that really is so much of a strength. Post-Keynesian economics is marginalized within economics that it shares uh, with other heterodox uh, streams. And that marginalization, uh, in my view, has tightened in academia since 2008. That's a bit perverse. Uh, because in some quarters in the general public, and also uh, if you talk uh, to the higher ups in universities, there was a perception that economics as it works uh, is, is not doing its job as a science. Certainly students felt so uh, uh, for a while. But if you think about uh, how uh, economics research is evaluated, what gets published in the top journals, very little has changed uh, in uh, how economics is practiced. Uh, and indeed, in most countries, because of uh, austerity, budget cuts for the university, essentially there's been downsizing, uh, there's been uh, a stop of hiring, and that typically is hurting uh, uh, heterodox non-mainstream economists. In the UK, specifically 
uh, the uh, research excellence framework, which is uh, the big uh, round of evaluation uh, of research of economics department that comes uh, with funding allocation for universities, essentially has tightened the screws uh, by giving funding only to what is considered three-star and four-star publications, which effectively rules out uh, funding for mainstream economics. And there's a reflection of that if you look at uh, already the last, I mean, that's a, a long process in economics and the REF uh, has in the UK played an important role. I presume the Handelsblatt ranking uh, in Germany is playing uh, a quite similar role. That's a process that's been going on for a long time and uh, we've actually looked at the submissions to the REF uh, in the 2014 REF and it's literally the case that there's uh, no heterodox economists anymore being submitted in uh, the economics panel. There are some that get transferred there from other panels. Uh, so there <clears throat> has been a limited impact, uh, but some increased interest uh, by policy institutions uh, and a little bit on uh, by progressive economic parties. Let me add to that, I think I've not said in the last slide that if there's an area in economics where you do see a change, then I guess it's the research agenda of the applied policy institutions. If you look at the research papers that are coming out of the IMF uh, and uh, the, um, the OECD, uh, there you actually uh, do see a somewhat different agenda. You're trying to that is not good for me. <laughs> um, then we want to speed up a little bit. Okay, so <laughs> what was I trying to tell you? Uh, again, thinking about uh, post-Keynesian economics, uh, if you read Granovetter's The Strength of Weak Ties, uh, which is a, a sort of a classic in uh, uh, network analysis, uh, what Granovetter is arguing that there's many occasions where uh, strong ties, while they breed cohesion, essentially also come with the danger uh, of isolation, whereas weak ties uh, uh, can, in, in some circumstances, actually serve as a bridge uh, and, and thus be more effective. If we think of uh, that, then uh, the, the sort of the, the theoretical coherence of post-Keynesian economics uh, in a way could also be uh, a weakness to what we are doing. There's various areas uh, where we have openings. Uh, the choice is obviously uh, highly subjective. Uh, I do want to uh, point out that agent-based modeling has gone macro. In my perception, that's a big change to say 10, 15 years ago. Uh, where there was uh, essentially the, the issues were around industrial economics. So you can think of uh, the, the series of uh, Keynes, Mitch, and Peter uh, uh, papers by Giovanni Dosi and his research group, uh, but there's also, and I, I'm delighted to uh, see that also at this conference there's an increasing number uh, of, of ABM papers. Uh, I think one important change is that uh, there is uh, a sort of the, the field of post-Keynesian ecological macroeconomics is uh, gaining a critical mass. Again, that's something that uh, I, I think was not the case uh, 10 years ago. It's also the case if you look at ecological economics, the journal, you will find several ecological economics papers that uh, do discuss post-Keynesian economics. Um, I presume Stephanie will uh, talk about uh, feminist economics. There have been one of, I think, the most fascinating papers in the uh, wage-led, profit-led demand regime uh, is a paper by Brownstein et al. where they combine demand regimes essentially with, with gender relations regimes. Uh, and uh, closer to what I'm doing now, uh, there is an increasing interest uh, in parts of the social sciences in what post-Keynesian economics uh, is doing in particular the notion of demand regime has been picked up uh, to analyze or to use as a foundation of uh, the varieties of capitalism uh, and uh, the concept of financialization and financial instability uh, is uh, increasingly uh, uh, used in uh, uh, socioeconomics or uh, uh, human and economic uh, geography. <clears throat> 
Right. What I want to do in the remaining whatever seven and a half minutes um, <laughs> is tell you a little bit uh, what I've been up to recently, uh, and that's under the heading of kalecki minsky modeling. You're not going to see a big model, but you're going to see different exercises of analyzing mostly empirically aspects of that. So essentially, what I mean by that is a, uh, is a model that has a Kaletskian goods market that allows for wage-led demand regimes, that has a Minskian financial market that generates uh, financial instability, and that has hysteresis on the labor market or on the supply side. Um, and I'll start with a paper on pseudo Goodwin cycle, which is the only theoretical paper that I'll talk about. Uh, in a paper uh, that came out last year with Joe Mitchell, we are demonstrating that pseudo Goodwin cycles can arise in a Minsky model with a wage led demand regime. That only will mean much to you if you're familiar with the debate on demand regime, where there uh, used to be that assertion that if you <coughs> observe something that looks like Goodwin cycles, that must be uh, due to, among other things, that you do have uh, a profit-led demand regimes. What we're doing in the paper is we're thinking about a Minsky economy where the cycle mechanism is driven by an interaction between the financial markets uh, and the real markets. So think of it as the financial market as debt. Uh, is leverage and uh, the real variable is growth, so the two of them interact uh, to, to generate cycles. Now, assume that that uh, Minsky model gets paired with a Marxist distribution function, where uh, higher output comes with high employment, uh, which increases the bargaining position of workers and thus the wage share. The question that, I'm, that we're asking in the paper essentially is, well, if a uh, a Marxist, a Goodwinian, is looking at that, uh, at that uh, model, uh, what is it that they are seeing? Uh, and the answer that we give is it's pseudo-Goodwin cycle. So we demonstrate that you get those uh, cyclical movements between distribution and output uh, in, these, uh, uh, in these models. Uh, and that's the beautiful diagrams uh, that we have uh, generated for that paper. What's the significance of that? The significance of that is that we, we are taking one uh, heterodox theory of business cycles and looking at it from the lens of another heterodox business cycle theory. And that, I think, is a worthwhile uh, research question. Uh, there's various heterodox business cycle arguments, but they've not been uh, put together and compared systematically. That's in a way what, re what we are reviving is the notion of observational equivalence, but in this case we can demonstrate that the cycle is not a Goodwin cycle, and it occurs even if we have a wage-led demand regime. Uh, so we've uh, empirically extended the baduri maglin model with financial variables uh, using different variables uh, according to the paper. And what we do find is that uh, certainly uh, since 1980s, uh, economically speaking, the effects of uh, the financial variables are substantially larger than the distributional effects. But rest in peace, we do find for most countries that domestic <laughs> demand is wage-led. Um, we have recently tried to uh, estimate minimalistic Minsky models. Uh, so theoretically, uh, one can distinguish between different families uh, of Minsky models, in particular debt cycles models uh, versus asset price models. We can think of household debt or business debt being the key variable. There's a recent very interesting literature, mainstream literature on financial cycles. That literature very often, that most of, much of that literature either uses uh, univariate filtering, so essentially they look at their financial variable in isolation and then wonder whether it gives you cycles, or they try to add some shocks to a, to a DSG model. Um, what we are trying to do is we try to think of uh, that cycle uh, is the outcome of that interaction of a financial and a real variable, and thus want to uh, essentially generate endogenous cycle. 
uh, and we are estimating different versions of that model, which essentially is a, is a 2D uh, VAR um, uh, for advanced economies. But what we're interested in is not, so we are, we are estimating a standard VR, but we are asking somewhat different questions. We are not asking how does the impulse response look like, but we are asking does that, does those, do those uh, VR coefficients, uh, are they consistent with endogenous cycles, meaning with persistent cycles, oscillations that have up as well as down swings, and what is the cycle length uh, implied uh, in these uh, in these cycles. And what we find there, actually a course of mine will be presenting that paper uh, tomorrow morning, uh, is that uh, we find for uh, business that, that indeed uh, we do find uh, uh, financial real interaction cycles. These are somewhat longer as regular business cycle where we were unable to find uh, similar cycles for household debt, which at least to me was a somewhat surprising result. Um, I'll skip the household debt and inequality because otherwise I will upset Miriam too much. Um, but I do very briefly want to talk about unemployment hysteresis. Uh, one of the odd developments in economics is that the Nairo theory, the traditional argument about the uh, the natural rate of unemployment did not feature prominently in the discussion of uh, uh, economic policy in the crisis. However, the policy recommendations uh, uh, that were given certainly by the Troika to the countries in crisis essentially were the Nairo recommendation, liberalize uh, the labor market. And one of the, so, so in other words, there, there's, uh, the Nairo is walking around like a zombie uh, is still there, but is not named. Um, and importantly, the Nairo has left the sediment uh, that the IMF, the OECD, are regularly reporting Nairo estimates, uh, as if they were a hard fact. Now, these Nairo estimates are based on the assumption of an exogenous Nairo. And so what we've done, or what we're doing in ongoing work, is essentially replicating and extending uh, the Nairo estimation that, say, the European Commission or the OECD are doing, but we are allowing for hysteresis, not in the sense of a unit rule in unemployment, but in the sense that actual unemployment is allowed to feed into structural unemployment. We're doing that both uh, using the Kalman filter, the way that the Commission uh, and the OECD are doing that, but we're also using uh, Bayesian estimators because they're giving us a somewhat tight uh, fit. And what we find uh, when we do that is that depending on the country, we are getting point estimates for the degree of hysteresis uh, of above 0.4 to in the order of magnitude of uh, 0.7. In, in other words, uh, a, probably in the order of magnitude of half of uh, actual unemployment feeds into structural um, there's a lot of wonderful slides that I'm skipping, uh, but I do uh, have a last slide which uh, I briefly want to talk to. So of course, uh, if one does give panel presentation, one has to end on a positive note, which I'm sometimes struggle to do, but here's my attempt. Uh, so what's uh, what is it that post-Keynesian economics looking forward? What is it that post-Keynesian economists should be doing? First, I recommend appreciating the strength of weak ties. I think we have, over the course of the last decades, consolidated uh, the core of post-Keynesian economics. It's, to some extent, time uh, to spread out, uh, both to other uh, heterodox uh, economists, uh, but also to other social scientists. Uh, and that I'm doing under the heading of reviving political economy. Um, there is traditions in uh, various social sciences, international political economy, critical political economy, cultural political economy, comparative political economy, that are building on a body of knowledge that in part uh, we are also part of. And indeed, if you look at the post-Keynesian literature of the 50s, of the 60s and 70s, you frequently find 
uh, the notion of political economy there. I'm not quite sure when we turned into post-Keynesian economists as opposed to post-Keynesian political economists, but I do think uh, it's worth uh, uh, strengthening the cooperation uh, with social sciences and uh, reviving that field of political economy. Part of that, I have to say, uh, because to some extent I also uh, have tired a bit of fighting uh, sort of the Goliath of neoclassical economics and wonder whether one shouldn't just uh, found a, a separate field of political economy uh, that becomes an economic discipline. That said, uh, long live Sisyphus. Uh, given that mainstream economics is providing the benchmark and the language of economics, um, I do think uh, as post-Keynesian economics, we have to uh, try to engage with, post uh, with mainstream economics. Now, I have little illusion that they're interested in listening to what we have to say, but I think given the position we're in, there's little alternative to try to be understood by them, not the least because there's a lot of other heterodox positions that are also essentially looking uh, like uh, the, 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 the mouse uh, looking at the rattlesnake, uh, looking at neoclassical economics, and thus uh, we, we have to, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, be compatible to them. I do think that there's something in terms of empirical analysis uh, that we uh, can learn from them. Ultimately, however, I think the fate of post-Keynesian economics will be decided on a much more political battlefield. Uh, it's hard not to paraphrase uh, Karl Marx, but economists essentially have Heiterdo only interpreted or in fact modeled the world differently. The point is to change it. I think ultimately the issue is uh, to what extent uh, post-Keynesian economists have useful interventions uh, that are useful both to policymakers and to social movements. Thank you.